Hello. Today we will be talking about Dracunculus, um, drugs associated with alcohol metabolism and alcohol metabolism. And I decided that we would start with a quiz. So, um, here's the first question. We have a homeless middle-aged male presenting in the emergency room in a state of intoxication, uh, behaviorally disinhibited and rowdy. He recently consumed about a pint of red-colored liquid that his friends were using to get high. He complains that his vision is like being in a snowstorm. The most likely cause of this patient's intoxicated state is the ingestion of... Ethanol? <laughs> Ethanol. Ethanol. Gosh. Correct. Methanol will cause the uh, retinal toxicity. Ethylene glycol will cause what the kidney uh, issues, <laughs> or uh, is it kidney or liver? Uh, kidney. Kidney. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, methanol fucks with your retinas. Sorry, I mean bleeps with your retinas. <laughs> <laughs> For our viewers out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we had a couple more questions, so, yeah. We're all, all this cool. <laughs> <laughs> Chronic alcoholic decides to stop drinking and asks his physician to prescribe the stuff that makes you sick if you drink. Which of the following enzymes or enzyme systems is inhibited by the drug in question? It's a B. Well, no, disulfan, so it's acetaldehyde, right? Why don't you hit next? Ta-da! Al yes. Aldehyde dehydrogenase, yeah. Aldehyde dehydrogenase, and yes. It's disulfram. Yes, the drug right, is disulfram, also called so, antabuse. Yeah, antabuse. So what drug does, or oh, actually, Divya, does, do you have a question for what drug does act at B? Um, it comes up later. <laughs> comes up later? Then you know what? We'll, we'll <laughs> let it go. We'll let it go. Continue on. Alrighty. Which of the following is a metabolite of methanol? Ah, uh, um, Acetylaldehyde? Mm. I would say oxalic acid. Mm. Is it formaldehyde? Yes. Ah. Formaldehyde. Methanol is converted so, to formaldehyde and formic acid. And then, uh, uh, um, the other ones turn to oxalic acid. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, because acetaldehyde is what alcohol is turned into, mm -hmm. and then acetic acid. Okay. And last question <clears throat> in this portion. Uh, following the ingestion of vodka, one would expect to find which of the following metabolites in the blood? Oh, I think I just said it. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> is it the acetaldehyde? Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Alrighty, so now we're going to talk about alcohol metabolism, and Yash, we are going to fill out this lovely chart. So, first of all, what enzyme is first converts these alcohols into their first metabolite? Is it alcohol dehydrogenase? Yes, it is. Go ahead and... Okay, so we're going to start with the ethylene glycol side. Um, what is the first metabolite of ethylene glycol? Again. <laughs> Formaldehyde? Go ahead and oh, glycoaldehyde. Wait, whoops. <laughs> That's okay. This is what this is here for. Now, what's the second enzyme 
that is used to convert glycoaldehyde into its next metabolite. Acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Yeah. No, aldehyde dehydrogenase. It's specifically acetaldehyde oh, for. Yes. Yeah, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. In general, some sort of aldehyde dehydrogenase, depending on gotcha. that. So, what does glycoaldehyde turn into? It has a similar name. Acetate? Mm, it has a similar name to. Glyco. Aldehyde? Uh, acid, uh, aldehyde? Acetaldehyde? Mm. Go ahead and hit it, Yash. It's going to first convert to glycolic acid Glyc and then one more time. Oxalic acid is your final product. Mm. Okay. Oops. <laughs> well, now for the methanol column. <laughs> What's our first metabolite? Formaldehyde. Yeah, formaldehyde. And our second Form metabolite? Formic acid. Correct. And now for ethanol. Our first metabolite? Acetaldehyde. Yep. Acetaldehyde. And our second and metabolite? Acetate. Yes. Or acetic that one I acid. Acetic <laughs> acid. Well, same thing. Yeah. Okay, so. Now I'm going to ask you the um, effects or the toxicities of these metabolites, starting with ethylene glycol and the oxalic acid. What sort of symptoms will we see? With? With, with oxalic acid. The... Uh... The headaches, uh -huh. oh, oh, ethylene glycol, uh, no, you're going to see, um, um, renal dysfunction, yes. except the big one. <clears throat> All right, yes. You'll see CNS depression, metabolic acidosis, yeah. and nephrotoxicity because oxalic acid causes oxalate crystals. Woo, not a fun yeah. thing now. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and then for formic acid, what kind of issues will we see? I already said it, so someone else said it. Someone else being young? Headaches. And? No, the other one. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> doesn't work with these headphones on. <laughs> uh, I just say it. <laughs> Retinal, it burns your retinas. <laughs> so, Retinopathy. Yeah. Does cause uh, ocular uh, damage and blurry vision, and <clears throat> this one also can cause Rest respiratory failure. Okay. And okay, yeah. Um, wait, uh, uh, so what is it? That's the uh, uh, mud piles. Oh, yeah, methanol, methanol toxicity. That's the M, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. And for ethanol, I'm actually going to ask the effects for acetaldehyde first, and then acetic acid, because both of them can cause some fun stuff. So what do we see with acetaldehyde? All right. Hangover so, system. Yeah. So your headaches, uh, nausea, vomiting, nausea, vomiting, general malaise. Yep. Correct. Yeah. We do see that. And one more time. All the alcohols across the board we know cause CNS depression and metabolic acidosis. So that's a given. And now for acetic acid. Lactic acidosis. You can yes. 
hypoglycemia? Um, Liver failure? There's something, one particular thing that I'm looking for and related to blood pressure. Oh, what? Oh, is it Hypo hypovolemia? Mm. Oh, blood. Oh, the al uh, alcohol metabolism increase your blood pressure? Decrease. You're going to get hypotension. <laughs> See, that's where I was going with the hypovolemia. Yeah, because <laughs> you're going to be having diarrhea. You're going to be shitting your pants. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll see the nausea, vomiting, headache, hypotension, and acetic acid can combine with folate to be inactivated, or can combine with thiamine, uh, which will decrease its availability in the body, which is why alcoholics are also thiamine deficient. Very, very. Yes. And, um... All of these can also cause symptoms of chronic alcoholism with overuse. So, anyone know what these symptoms of chronic alcoholism are, or what chronic alcoholism causes? Liver failure. Liver failure, yes, and cirrhosis. I guess if you want to be. Mm -hmm. Some someone mentioned Cold, something about hypertension, ascites, uh, esophageal varices. All of that, uh, yeah. Yash said what? something about sugar earlier. Hypoglycemia. Mm hmm. Um. Okay. Because your oxaloacetate. Yes. Okay, you can go ahead and click it. I did again. So, we have our, our um, clinical picture of chronic alcoholism that we'll generally see hypoglycemia, fatty liver, and lipemia, muscle wasting, and also gout, because lactate competes with urate for excretion. That, that, the gout, would that be when you're talking like an acute attack or over prolonged? Chronic alcoholism it will cause chronic gout. Mm. Meaning, like, if I were to binge drink, I'm an alcoholic, but if I, like, went out and drank, like, 12 beers on the weekend, that gout, would that be acute gout, or am I already feeling symptoms of gout for a long time? Nah, man, gout is known as the, the rich man's disease. So this is when you're constantly eating red meat, drinking beer, uh, constantly exposing yourself to th that, yeah. uh, those uh, urate byproducts. It's not just like, like I just, a weekend. Uh, I, I'm Yash. I've never had meat before, but I feel like having a steak tonight. Ah, my big toe. No, no, that doesn't happen. <laughs> this is like, you know, Donald Trump on his 30th fucking attempt at Mar-a-Lago <laughs> to have a steak. Oh, I'm sorry. It turns into political. Move on. <laughs> but yes, this, this was filmed in it, 2014. <laughs> As it says 2017 on this slide here. But um, yes, to answer your question, with <laughs> chronic alcoholism, you will get acute episodes of gout flare ups, though. Okay, gotcha. Yes. Clarification. <laughs> so this is from First Aid, page 68 in 2017. Just a little visual here about this whole ethanol metabolism cycle. Um, what's special about NAD plus in this? Is that the limited reagent? Yes, NAD plus is the limiting reagent. Um, and ethanol metabolism will increase the NADH, NAD plus ratio. So as you can see, you'll end up with more NADH. And does anyone know what this increased ratio will cause? Lactic acidosis. Yes. So it'll convert pyruvate to lactate, causing lactic acidosis. It will 
also convert oxaloacetate to malate, which will prevent gluconeogenesis and cause a hypoglycemia, and um, can also cause a hepatosteatosis by converting dihydroxyacetone phosphate to glycerol 3 phosphate. So, quite a mouthful there. Um, and yeah. So, oxaloacetate to malate, is that. Why is it going back? Because aren't you producing NADH from malate to oxaloacetate? You're. No, you're using up NADH to make NAD. So, oxaloacetate okay. uses up oh, NADH. Oh, so it's going to go back. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. In our lovely TCA cycle. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, next slide, please. So now we're going to talk about the drugs associated with alcohol metabolism. I had covered them up in the previous diagram, but um, we're going to talk about them here. So, Yash, can you click once? So the standard classic antidote for overdose of with ethylene, glycol, and methanol. This is something you can use specifically for just these two types of alcohols. Anything that is not your standard regular alcohol that you'd go out on. Ethylene glycol? Or is it from epazole still? Mm, it's not ethylene glycol because it's gonna it's an antidote for ethylene glycol. So it's for mepazole? Mm, no. Because fomepazole would affect all of them. Not your feet. So we have someone Let's say you're at some sort of house party and someone found some methanol lying around somewhere and then you're like, oh no, you weren't supposed to drink that. Let's give you something else to compete for metabolism. Something blue. Mm -hmm. Never mind. I'm out. <laughs> well, go ahead and click. It's actually going to be ethanol. <laughs> you can give regular alcohol to someone that has taken these alternative alcohols because they all compete for the amount of alcohol dehydrogenase that's available in the body. So ethanol has a um, selective affinity for um, alcohol dehydrogenase more than the other ones, so it's going to... Make your patient very, very drunk, but it will prevent all of these other side effects down here yeah. that are far worse than your general feeling drunk around for that day. And then, like you said, Yash, you can go ahead and hit again. You do have Femepazole for all three because it's a long-acting inhibitor of alcohol dehydrogenase. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Now there's one more drug that I would like you guys to... Oh, great. <laughs> well, y'all... No one's all. <laughs> no one's all. <laughs> what drug <laughs> um, inhibits a later step in ethanol metabolism? Disulfiram inhibits the acetaldehyde dehydrogenase specifically um, and will cause hangover symptoms. Hangover symptoms, correct. Okay, so we have a few other questions to make sure we learn something today. So, why does. <laughs> Administration of ethanol help in the treatment of a person with methanol poisoning. 
drinking. So methanol, we don't want it to turn into the toxic byproducts. So, okay. Competes with, yeah. <clears throat> Competes for mm -hmm. alcohol dehydrogenase axis. So just yeah. like we saw in that previous picture. Um, can you go back, Yash? So just to reiterate, again, ethanol has a higher affinity for alcohol dehydrogenase than methanol does. So you're going to saturate that enzyme with ethanol to prevent the formation of methanol's metabolites. Okay. Metronidazole is the prototypical agent associated with the development of disulfiram-like reactions. Which of the following other medications is associated with the development of this same reaction? Ooh. Is it a C? D? Yes, that's a no. Mm. Yes, that's a no. <laughs> it's not Vanco. No, it is not Vanco. It's B. Yes, Sappho Titan is correct. And Yash, if we'll go to the next slide. The drugs that cause a disulfiram like reaction can be remembered. Again, from first aid with the mnemonic, sorry, pals, can't go mingle. So, can you guys name the other drugs in this mnemonic? Uh, right, well, I'm the M is the metro. C is the cephot -tan. What is cephot -tan? It's got to be a cephalosporin, yes. first or second gen, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Uh, uh, sulfanamides? Is sulfanamides a DS? Yeah. Sulfanamides, okay. Gentamicin? Mm. Aminoglycosides? Mm -mm. I have no horse in this race, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> you can go ahead and click, yeah. I want to try. Procarbazine. Procarbazine. Oh. Griseofulvin. God damn it, yeah, griseofulvin, that's right. Ah. Okay, so so funny. Right, so so funny areas, that's one of the, uh, th that was, again, like Fisher said, one of the reasons that so funny areas went out of style. You couldn't drink on them. Uh, Procarbazine, what is that? That's a uh, anti epileptic, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, certain cephalosporins, I'm getting this, the cephotitan. Graziofulvin. Mm -hmm. That's antifungal. If you used to have onychomycosis, that's what we gave you for 12 fucking months or whatever. And what is and its P450 interaction? I'm sorry? What is its P450 interaction? Is it an inducer or an inhibitor? Griseofulvin? It's an inducer. Yes. And then we okay. have metronidazole right. at the end. And the um, specific cephalosporins that um, are usually known for disulfiram-like reactions are cephotitan and cephoperazone is the other one. Okay. All righty. Sorry. Sorry, hang on. If anybody's listening. Oh. Procarbazine is not an antiplastic. It's an antineoplastic alkylating agent. Yeah. Duh. Procarbazine is one that you'd see in the probably hemong section where they have that all the antineoplastic drugs there. Okay. It's not an antipleptic. Alrighty. Um, um, Just like it. 
Okay, go. <laughs> Jack whatever that is. Stracunculus <laughs> is the bug we will be speaking about today. It is yes, that one. Not very um, high yield per se, but it is um, very interesting um, species to see what it does. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. Uh, the specific species of Dracunculus that we will be talking about is Mendonensis. 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 Also known as the guinea worm. This is the one that specifically affects humans, and then you have Insignis, which infects dogs and wild carnivores, etc., etc. So, what does it cause in humans? Um, so, again, since this is so super easy, <clears throat> and not I'm quite familiar, is this one that kind of um, um, it penetrates through, let's say, a foot of someone walking through soil that might have this um, worm in it? It'll be through what, water, your... not I'm soil. Sorry? It'll be through water, not soil, but yes, it'll that, penetrate. Uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> This will be someone walking in some river or something, cold water. Okay, and I'm guessing it's going to suck your blood. Uh, that's how I'm just going to get that. <laughs> it's going to cause anemia. It is not, actually. <laughs> okay, then, uh, yeah, you're up. Anaphylactic shock. No. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know anything about I this. actually did... Not such a great job of covering certain things in this slide, so if you actually see the insignis underneath, what it causes, it causes the same thing in humans minus the heart and vertebral column lesions. Oh my god, it causes fingerprinting? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you think these guys be way more high yield if they cause DNA fingerprinting? <laughs> That's how you differentiate it. Oh, oh, I had to read the fourth word. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Yash, if you go ahead and... It, it causes cutaneous nodules and subsequent ulcers. Yeah, look, I would have figured that out. <laughs> so, this is how this particular worm infects. You have the anterior end of the female worm... Um, which will invade the host's body, usually through a lower limb, through an ulcer. Um, and then when the worm feels the presence of cold water, contractions in its body causes its uterus to burst, releasing hundreds of thousands of larvae into the water, further contaminating the water so it can go infect other people. God, that sounds freaking disgusting. Yeah. Hang on, I'm just wondering if it, if it, if this is through an already formed ulcer, like you popped a zit on your ankle and then you went for a dive and then the thing goes for it, or if it can actually penetrate through your skin. Because it says here through an ulcer in the lower limb. Either way, I don't want my lower limbs impregnated by anything, but <laughs> that's just me. <laughs> Well, the next slide will explain a little further about how this thing infects. Oh, is this like a PG? Do we need to PG rated R movie coming up? Like no, no, say, hey, no, no, no. USF police students, if you got children, <laughs> you open their eyes on this next slide. It's it's <laughs> it's just a drawing, so it'll be okay. It'll be fine. Show on this doll where the <laughs> dracunculus touched you. <laughs> does this thing have weird teeth like a dracula? <laughs> no, it does not. <laughs> okay, moving on. The other. Stop um... guessing. You're gonna ask what the treatment is. <laughs> I can almost guarantee you, unless it's like ivermectin or 
some other anti protozoan. Well, I'll give you a hint. It is a drug that we have already talked about That's today. True. Yes, correct. Really? <laughs> yeah. Metro. So the thing with Metro is that it doesn't necessarily treat the worm exactly. It just makes it easier to extract it from the host. Ah. So, so blow the diaphragm, man. I was going to say, it, it ceases <laughs> the worm from bursting hundreds of thousands of larvae into you. So it's essentially a pre-ejaculation stopper. <laughs> For right. the worm, yes. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Metro. <laughs> yeah. All right, so... I promised a diagram. Here's a diagram from the CDC, kind of about how this thing infects. So somewhere along the lifespan of this person's life, they drank some unfiltered water that had some copepods of this dracunculus, and um, that got into the body. <clears throat> And um, the larvae were released, and then they penetrate the host's stomach and intestinal wall. They're living their lives so you need up to block in there. Your gastrin on this one. Sorry, what? I said this is where you need to block your gastrin on this one. <laughs> and then they mature, and they reproduce, and they turn into these really obnoxious long worms. And <clears throat> um, at some point. A fertilized female worm will migrate to the surface of the skin, and when it um, feels presence close to cold water, it will cause a blister and um, exit through the lower limb of the host. And uh, once it's released into the water, then um, the worm can release all its larvae out in there, and those are further consumed by other copepods in the water, and so on and so forth. We have this lovely cycle going on. The female's like 800 times longer than the male. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, sorry, what are the, uh, so what are the long-term human manifestations of, this, uh, of this cycle? Um, they, they, they're obviously going to eventually, as the cycle continues, they're going to manifest in the human GI system. So what? They are so going to, they're most. very, very long worms within the human GI system. They don't really okay. cause um, significant symptoms within the GI system the you'll notice them when they cause these blisters and what they'll do is you'll see part of the worm sticking out of this blister oh kind of, see this is this is what the fuck I was talking about you're telling me I'm full of shit I was saying that this is the one that's gonna manifest as a, a worm penetrating through your your, your lower extremity and you're like oh you, I said okay. it wasn't soil that's all I said that it was not oh, soil it was water you're right you're right you're right you're right you're right I said soil and you said water but yeah so if this worm dies inside of you this is when it manifests through the spinal cord issues um so not necessarily. You will get, so you mentioned anaphylactic shock. If this worm gets broken inside of you, it will cause anaphylactic shock. So, so that's when, okay, but what if it dies inside of you and you don't get it out? Well, if it's in your GI system, I'm sure it just goes with the rest of your GI yeah. motility yeah. stuff. Because I was wondering, because the other one, the other, I guess, name, the one that does the animal bites, not the the one with the M, but the I, the one that starts with the I. Insignus, yeah, causing yeah. <clears throat> heart That causes and the heart problems and the spinal cord issues. So, 
would the first one eventually cause the same thing if it dies? It hasn't been mentioned to cause the same thing. Um, okay. I've only seen where in Cygnus is the one that causes those particular adverse effects. Um, but just this for this one is what I've heard. And um, this is the worm that's... So it Oh, oh, this is a worm that's associated with the medical symbol because the extraction of the worm <laughs> requires slowly twisting it along a stick or a pencil approximately two centimeters per day. And um, what they'll, oh. they'll do is they'll you have to move it very, very slowly so you won't risk breaking the worm and causing that anaphylactic shock and each day what they'll do is tape the stick to the person's leg so they can just carry on the next day with their so every day you need to take metro to get this thing out just two centimeters you you can take metro to prevent to try and prevent the worm from breaking okay yeah, you're talking about two different aspects of treatment there Metro is just like in case shit goes down, it ain't gonna be as bad. But the the little like stick like is the actual physical <laughs> extraction. <laughs> well, no, because she's right. Because if you if you just like just go like oh fuck it, I'm gonna take it out. That worm's gonna tear. It. Yeah, it's just like if you if you rupture an abscess in a surgery, dude, you've got. A, all of this, you know, um, infectious material just disseminating through the blood system, and uh, not so good shit. Mm -hmm. So hang on. Um, so does this worm manifest? It, yeah. So obviously, this is like a cutaneous, and obviously, eventually, a GI type of worm. Does this manifest like um, 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 Ascaris lumbricoides, if I remember correctly? That's the one that, like, it's the worms coming out of your butthole, right? That's yes. Ascaris, right? Yes. The so worm. Do these guys manifest like that? Or are they more internal? Do you know? Um... If you don't know, it's cool. I was just curious, just based on this diagram, because it's like, it's clearly these guys end up or they want to end up in your, your intestines, or at least that's where they kind of start growing. Yeah, I'm not sure if they end up like Ascaris and have like the pinworms out of the anus sort of type of presentation. These want to leave through the skin. So. Oh, oh, oh. these guys want to leave. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're gonna come out of your Ascaris wants to stay. Ah, okay. My these bad. These guys, these guys are. I guess I should have read this little thing because I see now numbers and um. Yeah. yeah. So these guys. I was, I was paying attention to you the whole time. I wasn't even looking at this damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> these guys will invade and penetrate through the stomach because mm. the the way the person first gets infected is by drinking contaminated water so it's already going through the gi tract so now these guys want to leave the gi tract and go towards the skin and get back out there and infect more people they just want to be loved by everybody so they're just trying to get it takes out there. one year though from that whole process of drinking water to it affecting your skin yeah it takes a whole one whole year in your body after infection that's crazy to create the blister. It's a distance. They got to travel through the GI tract and migrate all the way out to the skin after maturing and reproducing within the GI tract. It takes a very, very long time. Um, That's what you get from traveling to Cleveland. <laughs> and the, the males die within the host and the females are the ones that will be migrating outward. Um, and... In men, these can also migrate to the scrotum, so that's okay. that's a fun presentation to have them try to the, escape through there. Gives the bag of worms phenomenon a whole <laughs> different meaning. Yes, 
quite different. The bad worms are on the right side. What the fuck? They're trying to penetrate the bad. Alrighty. Ash, yeah, next slide. So last but not least, well, last for today, um, we're going to talk about Metro since we've mentioned it more than once. Um, anyone tell me the mechanism of Metro Next Law? Okay, so they create toxic metabolites which uh, hinder the bacteria Material cell wall. Um, I don't think it's the cell wall. No, it has something to do with met metronidazole's byproduct creates toxic metabolites to hinder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wanted to say something about. Uh, folic. Um, not sure. Okay. I know it's something with the free radicals, but I don't remember. You can go ahead and click. So, you guys are... Okay, well, we're both right. <laughs> yes. I said toxic, you said free radicals. <laughs> and free radicals are toxic, so... <laughs> and metabolites. Yeah, and that's so damn good. Okay. Antiprotozole. Well. It's bactericidal, antiprotozole, hence you know, why we can use it for dracunculus, amongst other things. Um, so it can treat a number of conditions. <laughs> um, Giardia. Giardia. No. And to me, the histolytica. Trichomotis. Can you use it in C. diff? C. diff. Can you use it in H. pylori treatment as a quadruple therapy or a triple therapy? There okay. you go. Um, so you have the get. Uh, get. Gardenola, Gardenola vaginalis. Mm -hmm. Anything below the diaphragm? Mm. Anaerobic infections below the diaphragm? Yeah. So. Anaerobic, yeah. Um, bacterial, bacterioides. No, yeah, that's that's good. You can go ahead and click. So yeah, you guys got them, got them all with the mnemonic. Get gap on the metro. Um, Giardia, Entamoeba, Trichomonas, Gardnerella, Arabs, like you said, bacterioides, C. diff, and in place of amoxicillin in H. pylori triple therapy, which. We talked about oh, okay. the other day. So yeah, yeah, she, you brought that up yesterday. So so Metro can be used in place of amoxicillin, which Fisher said that you've got to do the triple two quadruple therapy. But it looks like you can just swap out amox for Metro, mm -hmm. of course. So which makes sense. I mean, why, why you got to throw in two antibiotics for just one not working? So. Well, I'm just not sure if you would switch. Like, you could probably still add bismuth, but you need to switch the te to tetracycline. I'm sure either therapy would work. It's just kind of a doctor's preference. I'm learning yeah. more and more. There's literally, like, doc preference, you know. <laughs> um, so you mentioned <clears throat> that this treats infections below the diaphragm. What can we use for anaerobes above the... Okay. Clinda? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, I said it before I saw it. Clinda? Yes. My bad. I'm Clinda firing you from doing this clicking job. Staff strap, and robes. Staff strap, and robes. Staff strap, and robes. Clinda. Yes. <laughs> and adverse effects of medicine. Disulfram like effects. Yes. And what and are those effects? In the mouth. And metal. And you can get, you can cause seizures in really high doses. Yes, yeah. it's true. Yeah. We'll see, as I know. But yes. you're right. Disulfiram like reaction with flushing, tachycardia, hypotension, and headache, metallic taste. And oh, they didn't put seizures. They did not put seizures, but that is correct. Also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
This one you can give in pregnancy, correct? The sulfum is, I mean, I'm sorry, metronidazole is safe in pregnancy, right? Yeah. According to Fisher, according to Fisher, <laughs> to all the viewers out there that might be wondering, watch MedQuest there. Shameless Fisher plug. I hope he sponsors us. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, yeah, that's what we have for today. Yeah, so, um, I hope that was beneficial to anybody, and, uh, if Conrad Ferris is watching, feel free to do a, uh, a join in on one of our Skype sessions one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> that's episode three, we're already asking. Okay, uh, <laughs> why don't you come on up? <laughs> We invite you all. <laughs> of course. 